Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. U.S. Navy vessels often operate at sea for months at a time, far from ports and logistical hubs. To sustain these extended deployments, the Navy relies on a range of innovative methods to keep ships armed, fueled, and their crews well fed. One of the oldest and most versatile resupply techniques for ground forces is the airdrop. As the name suggests, an airdrop involves delivering critical supplies, such as ammunition, equipment, food, humanitarian aid, or even classified information via aircraft. Unlike traditional deliveries that require landing, an airdrop allows the aircraft to remain airborne, releasing its cargo from the rear hatch or ramp while in flight. Pallets or containers are often equipped with parachutes to ensure a controlled descent. While long being used for ground forces, these techniques have never been used on a large scale with naval vessels. Naval supply vessels can be tracked across the ocean and can potentially uncover the location of submarines they are intending to meet. To maintain the stealth of subs operating globally, aerial resupply could be a potential game changer with respect to speed and stealth. For submarines, airdrops are especially critical. These stealthy vessels lack open decks or large receiving platforms, making conventional resupply methods impractical. Compounding the challenge, submarines are often engaged in covert operations within potentially hostile or contested waters. As such, their time on the surface, when they are most vulnerable, must be kept as brief as possible. Airdrop deliveries are specifically adapted to these constraints. Packages are engineered to be waterproof and buoyant, allowing them to float upon contact with the sea. Self-deploying parachutes ensure a gentle descent, minimizing the risk of damage from impact. In harsher environments, such as icy or sub-zero waters, additional precautions are taken. These may include thermal insulation, reinforced casings, or protective coatings to shield the contents from freezing temperatures and saltwater exposure. Such adaptations ensure that even under the most demanding conditions, submarines can receive essential supplies without compromising their mission or stealth. The U.S. Navy dedicates significant time and resources to perfecting underway replenishment operations, including those tailored specifically for submarines. In this video, naval commanders showcase emerging techniques in aerial resupply including the integration of unmanned aerial vehicles. When operated remotely, these drones can execute pinpoint deliveries, such as dropping small packages or essential equipment, directly onto the limited surface area of a surfaced submarine. 
For larger scale replenishments, helicopters remain a reliable option, offering the ability to hover and perform precision drops even in challenging sea conditions. Similarly, the V-22 Osprey, with its unique tilt-rotor design, enabling both vertical takeoff and fixed-wing flight, plays a critical role in rapid response logistics. Extensively used for transport and resupply missions, the Osprey combines the maneuverability of a helicopter with the range and speed of a conventional aircraft making it an ideal platform for delivering supplies to remote naval assets, including submarines operating far from friendly ports. A submarine can destroy targets in a matter of minutes, but instead of being afraid of attacks by enemy warships, the biggest threat for sailors is starting a fire inside a submarine. In fact, fires have proven to be the most common reason for casualties aboard a submarine. Therefore, submarine crews are frequently trained to learn how to prevent and address fires. Great for fire and general emergency. Since submarines are fully enclosed, there is no way for smoke and heat to escape into the atmosphere which causes the smoke to rise and occupy the highest spot of the submarine, where the entire control equipment is located. Fires can move quickly from deck to deck because each level is not self-contained. According to the U.S. Navy, a fire could sweep through an entire submarine in under 30 minutes. For this reason, fire drills are more common than almost any other exercise on board. During a fire drill, crew members wear a protective breathing apparatus to minimize smoke inhalation. On the other hand, control room personnel monitor the spread of fire and update the entire crew via the PA system. Meanwhile, the entire crew fights the fire using hoses spread around the ship. Once the fire is out, the crew performs a damage assessment to determine whether the submarine can continue its mission. Undersea Rescue Command is the sole provider of U.S. submarine rescue support. Its mission is worldwide submarine assessment, intervention, and rescue. The most important job of this department is conducting Submarine Rescue Chamber SRC operations. Operated by two crew members, the submarine rescue chamber is lowered to the submarine by a tethered cable. Once reached, the chamber seals over the submarine's hatch, allowing the sailors to be safely transferred to the rescue chamber. The submarine rescue chamber can rescue up to six people at a time and reach a submarine at depths of 850 feet. It consists of an upper and lower compartment. The upper compartment is maintained at atmospheric pressure and contains operators, passengers, and controls whereas the lower compartment is flooded at ambient sea pressure and blown dry after mating to transfer personnel. Open. 
It contains a downhaul drum and spooling device. The ballast tanks are normally dry but flooded during the mating process to provide additional weight. All in all, the SRC is considered one of the most important components of the search and rescue operations for submariners. Air-delivered cargo is critical in the operations of ground forces on the battlefield. Whether it is the delivery of supplies or vehicles, or the actual delivery of paratroopers on the battlefield, transport aircraft play a vital role in modern combat. Whether the transport aircraft used is the C-17 or the C-130 Hercules, the process of loading and airdropping Humvees is the same. The only difference is that the C-17 is bigger than the C-130 cargo aircraft. The loadmasters have a huge task on their hands, especially when it's time to airdrop these vehicles. This is because they must ensure the safety of the troops and the vehicles. Hence, they are also trained in the airdropping process, which consists of various activities. At the drop destination, the pilots ensure that C-17 drops the cargo at an airspeed of around 140 knots while flying at least 750 feet above ground level. As soon as the navigator gives the green light to drop the cargo, the loadmaster releases the drogue to pull out the large extraction chute. The drag on the extraction chute unlocks the cargo from the aircraft's cargo rails and pulls it out of the C-17. To further improve the skills of the loadmaster, they are also trained in the techniques of providing airlift and airdrop support for the U.S. Army. For instance, the U.S. Army conducted an Arctic Anvil exercise at the Camp Shelby Joint Forces Training Center, Mississippi. The training lasted through the whole month of October 2019. The exercise is a multinational, force-on-force -force training that involves dropping cargo and equipment from a moving C-130 in the air. The loadmasters are drilled on the importance of this operation and its importance to the overall success of the mission. They are made to know that driving a supply truck to an austere location on the battlefield is not an option. This is because it endangers the ground forces and their equipment. Hence, the airdrop operation is a way to ensure the ground troops never run out of supplies without compromising their safety. Far from dropping only supplies and equipment, the C-130 can also be used for the rapid insertion of troops onto the battlefield. Known as the paratroopers, these special force members are trained to be dropped by parachute from an airplane into enemy territory. They are always ready and are trained to deploy on short notice. The U.S. Army usually conducts Arctic airborne operation training to simulate a forcible entry operation to seize an airfield. This exercise is used to test the ability of the paratroopers to face a near-peer threat similar to what is expected on the battlefield. This is especially important in austere and cold areas, such as the Arctic regions. In some instances, some paratroopers can act as the opposition force, 
providing a realistic and challenging opponent to test the Arctic tactics and procedures. Like a loadmaster for cargo drops, jump masters play an active role in dropping the paratroopers to the drop zone. They come up with the logistics and the procedure for an effective dropping exercise since they are responsible for the safety of cargo and troops. The paratroopers would strap themselves with all the required equipment and gear for the mission. Following that, they form a single queue at the request of the jump master in order to perform the static line parachute jump from the moving C-130. At the drop zone, the pilot attains an adequate combination of airspeed and altitude before the paratroopers jump out of the plane one after the other. Aside from airdropping into the drop zone, the paratroopers are also drilled in casualty evaluation training during a swift response exercise. This training is considered essential since casualty triage and evaluation are essential in preparing for a potential combat situation. The training encompasses the specific needs of the region. It includes having medical personnel deal with mock injuries related to the paratroopers jumping into Arctic and subarctic conditions. Here, you can see a medical practitioner using a snowmobile to attend to a paratrooper who got injured while jumping into the region. From the unforgiving depths of the ocean to the frozen skies above remote battlefields, air delivery has become a cornerstone of modern military logistics. Whether resupplying stealth submarines without compromising their cover, deploying humanitarian aid to war zones, or dropping armored vehicles and elite paratroopers into combat, the U.S. military continues to refine and expand the capabilities of aerial delivery. These operations not only ensure that troops remain equipped and mission ready, but also showcase the technological ingenuity and adaptability that define today's armed forces. As threats evolve and environments grow more challenging, the importance of rapid, flexible, and precise airlift operations will only continue to grow on land, at sea, and deep beneath the waves. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.